And this is something everyone knows but rarely says, and that is this, that once the number of non-whites reaches a certain level in an area, whites will not or cannot stay. They refuse to be a minority. They move away from those places where they have become minorities, and they seek solace in those places where they are once again a majority. This is an empirical, utterly dependable phen phenomenon, and it's a fact that everyone, and I mean everyone, knows this to be true, little though they may wish to talk about it. The process simply doesn't work the other way. Not even the most ardent integrationist is willing to take the most obvious step to make integration really come about. That is to say, to buy a house in a black neighborhood, or move into a Mexican neighborhood, or even for that matter, in many cases, send their children to public school. As far as whites are concerned, once a school or a part of a city has gone majority black or Hispanic, or even Asian in some cases, it might as well have disappeared from the map of their city. It becomes terra incognita, a little bit like those portions of ancient maps that used to say, here be dragons. What was once part of our nation and part of our civilization has slipped its leash. Therefore, one thing that we can say with complete certainty about the demographic change of the, in the United States is that whites will withdraw from more and more parts of their country. It will, of course, be physically possible for whites to live with the Mexicans in Brownsville, Texas, or with blacks in Camden, New Jersey, but most will do just about everything possible to avoid it. Because the fact is, many of us can think of neighborhoods, of towns, of villages, places where we would like to live. And it's almost a certainty that if a white person is thinking of these places, they'll all have large white majorities. And by the same token, it would be difficult for any white person in the United States to name a single neighborhood or town in which you would wish to live that does not have a white majority. You're telling me Americans feel blessed by diversity? Yes, blessed they by, do. Why is it that they escape from it every, at every opportunity? Why is it that every church service practically in this country is segregated? Why you, is it that when people are free to invite their own selection of guests to their backyard barbecue or their dinner party, it's almost always homogeneous and not diverse? It's because call, diversity what? is not a source of strength. It's a source of hostility. People don't want it in their own lives if they can help. I am always amazed at the generosity of liberals. Let, let me make a point here, Mr. Donahue. I'm, I'm listening. Liberals are convinced that it is wonderfully enriching to go to school with poor Mexicans or Haitians who can't speak English or with ghetto blacks who beat you up and shake you down for lunch money. That's wonderfully diverse. That's wonderfully enriching. But yes. they nobly forego that for their children. No, no. They reserve this wonderful diversity for the children of white people yes. who live in trailer yes. parks. On this question of diversity, there is a tremendous amount of hypocrisy. As you know, the pillars of society, the representatives of all our institutions, are constantly telling you that diversity, whether it's linguistic or racial or cultural, is a wonderful, wonderful thing. Well, how do they live their lives? Bill Clinton, uh, the great white father of a few terms ago, uh, probably more than any president in American history, trumpeted uh, the advantages of diversity. Well, where was it that he chose to buy a house when he left the White House? Chappaqua, New York. It's about one of the whitest places you can find this side of Iceland. And uh, Teddy Kennedy, another great champion of diversity. Where is the Kennedy compound, Hyannisport? On the beaches of Hyannisport, you're very unlikely to find any Haitian boat people drifting up. No, it's about, once again, as white a kind of a place as you can find in the United States. I find, frankly, the kind of hypocrisy expressed by these alleged champions of diversity to be quite contemptible. They themselves can live in a way to insulate themselves from the brute strangeness of people that don't speak English or whose religion and culture are drastically different from theirs. Diversity of the kind that we're often being asked to celebrate is not a source of strength, but a source of weakness. And I suppose I should first talk about uh, what, in fact, diversity is. There are various kinds of diversity that we can think about and consider. And some, under certain circumstances, are, in fact, a strength and a benefit. Let us imagine that uh, you're wanting to have a house built. 
Well, under those circumstances, it is good to have a diversity of professions. You'll need some carpenters. You might need some bricklayers, people who can pour concrete, roofers, electricians. Yes, you do need a diversity of skills to accomplish many things. However, when we are asked to celebrate diversity, that's not the kind of diversity people have in mind. What they do have in mind would be a different sort. Let us imagine that instead of all of these professions being uh, carried out by all white men, for example, let us assume that diversity was being celebrated by having the workforce divided up uh, among blacks, Hispanics, Asians, perhaps uh, some Palestinians, perhaps some Israelis. Uh, would that make the job go more smoothly or would it not? And since we're also talking about multiculturalism and not just racial diversity, let us imagine that we're adding to this brew real cultural diversity, different religions, perhaps different dietary habits, different languages. Now, would all of this make the job of building that house go more smoothly? I suggest to you that it would not. Diversity of that kind, a kind of status, diversity rather than real functional competence diversity is not a source of strength. In fact, in the United States today, to consider diversity of this kind a strength is a very recent thing. Up until perhaps 30 or 40 years ago, no one suggested that it was. I'm not talking about individuals. You can Shoot. have all sorts of individual exceptions. I'm talking oh, about oh, group exception. dynamics. Exception. Yes, you, in, when you have group dynamics, you invariably have group and ethnic tension. Weird. You can have individuals who get along fine, but when you get groups together, there's invariably friction, friction this and is, that cannot be avoided. Diversity is not only a strength, some people go so far as to say it's our greatest strength. That despite repeated efforts, no one was found to take that view. Curious, isn't it? Well, most of the time, as I say, we're only, a, this fact is merely asserted, and very seldom do we hear examples given as to how, in fact, it is a strength. Well, if I did have a debater to oppose me this evening, let me try to give you some of the things that that person might say. Such a person might say that a diverse country can better understand the world. <clears throat> if we have residents from all around the world, that will make us better understand our neighbors and our trade partners. Well, I would suggest to you the United States is, in fact, more racially and ethnically diverse than at any time in its history. We're also more hated than at any time in our history. I would suggest to you also that it's not simply because we are a powerful nation and we are in the midst of war. In 1945, relatively speaking, the United States was vastly more powerful than it is today relative to any competing power. We had also just finished a war in which we had killed hundreds of thousands, perhaps as many as a million people. And yet, our nation was quite beloved at that time. We were not hated for our strength. Of course, in 1945, we were a considerably more homogeneous country, perhaps 85, 90% white. Today, whites are about perhaps 70% and increasingly losing numbers in terms of percentage. So I think the idea that somehow the presence of a racial diverse population is going to make us better understand the world certainly doesn't suggest it doesn't suggest that this is borne out by our current circumstances another theory might be that diversity is a good thing for trade we have an increasingly shrinking world foreigners are closer and closer all the time trade is more rapid communication is constant and that having a diverse population once again will help us better understand our trade partners and mean that we can have a nice trade surplus. Well, as any of you know here who have the least understanding of economics, you know that our trade deficit is very, very high. And in fact, the most successful trading nations in the world today, China, Japan, Korea, they certainly don't celebrate diversity. If you were to go to, J go to China, which now has uh, what about an annual hundred billion dollar trade surplus for the United States? If you were to suggest to them, look, fellas, uh, you could uh, export a whole lot more all around the world if you had maybe a million Nigerians or maybe half a million Puerto Ricans or a quarter of a million Pakistanis. Come on, that's how you can really boost your trade. They would call for the men in the white coats. They'd have a nice padded cell for you. They'd think you were nuts. Look, 
there are certain countries, Japan, for example, many Filipinos, many South Asians would love to live in Japan because it's a wealthy, successful country. The Japanese have this quaint idea that they'd like Japan to stay Japanese. They don't let them in. They simply assert it. Diversity is a strength. End of argument. Now, I was asked to speak about multiculturalism and racial diversity. In fact, in the United States today, multiculturalism goes essentially hand in hand with racial diversity. Why is that? Because when people are from essentially the same ethnic group, European immigrants to the United States, it's been demonstrated over and over that after about two or three generations, it makes no difference whether your ancestors came from Ireland, or from Italy, from Hungary, Scandinavia, after two or three generations, European-derived Americans are essentially indistinguishable in terms of per capita income, likelihood to go to college, likelihood to marry outside their original European group. And in fact, this phenomenon, I think, uh, puts the lie to the current view that today's immigrants, Asians and Hispanics, people were told over and over, okay, if there's a problem, it will go away. There were certain problems in assimilating the Italians and the Irish. Those problems were overcome. We all became Americans. The same will happen with the Vietnamese or the Hmong or the Haitians. Well, that ignores an important thing. That ignores an aspect of assimilation that makes people very uncomfortable, and that is race. People who came from Europe were able to assimilate in a way that people who had been here far longer, that is to say, blacks and American Indians, have not assimilated in the same way that the Italians and the Irish have done. And given, of course, that at the, at the, at the present time, the United States shows very little inclination to try to have people assimilate, the idea that people from Asia or, His or Hispanics, people from the Caribbean are going to assimilate just the way the Irish and Italians did, I think, is a pipe dream. The other theory is that a diverse society on, on a college campus, for example, opens us up to different points of view. Well, in the United States and in Canada as well, the point of view, this illuminating point of view you're likely to get from students of color is very much what Professor March, without being a person of color himself, has told us. The same litany of persecution, of oppression, chip on the shoulder. If you really wanted a diverse set of opinions from a college, from a college campus, you might uh, try admitting an Afrikaner from South Africa, or race realists such as myself, or just a plain old conservative. Then you might get some dissent from the prevailing, mind-numbing orthodoxy of racial diversity. I do not claim that whites are sinless, nor would I take the view which he seems to take that whites are somehow uniquely evil. Isn't that the impression you got from what you just heard? I'm saying that human beings are tribal. They have a natural preference for people like themselves. That is normal, it is healthy, why build a society on the assumption that this must be overcome? Why subject Canada to a, an unnecessary experiment? Why pose difficulties that may not be solvable to a people? The Canadian people never said, oh, why yes, I grew up in Canada, but I'd like to grow old in Haiti. But no, they are to be made to live in this because of people like Professor March who say it's got to be done. This is your destiny, and we've got to make it work. We're all going to be feeding on each other's, on each other's differences. And if whites have given up this healthy notion of who they are and liking who they are, if they let their societies drift out of their control, then they will find themselves minorities in their own country. Will that be a good thing? What if there's only a 15% chance that a third world, a population third world Canada will be like the third world? What if there's just a 10% chance? What if there's just a 1% chance that I'm right? Don't you think that possibility should be prevented? Canada and the United States do not owe their countries to the rest of the world.